You know, a lot of people, they don't know when to clap or how to clap. Some clap on every beat, and that's okay. Some clap on the upbeat, some clap on the downbeat. The, the idea is to be in beat. Can you say amen? Anyway, I want to remind you that we are having a play next week. Amen. It's, it's a wonderful one. Amen. I know that don't leave the spirit even though I'm talking to you. You don't, you don't have to do Jesus never left the spirit no matter how many interruptions. So don't leave that. You know, that's not a distraction. And back to, to the play. I want to give out more tickets and for you to give out and give away. Also, remember the thing is if you give out a ticket or an invitation to watch it or, or to come, Lord, and they think you went out of your way to get them a ticket, they'll take you more seriously. You know, and seriously, people think that way. The, it seems like society conditions people certain ways. Have you noticed that? Anyway, so I want to give out more tickets after and make sure you get a few more. I was hoping Joe would stay here a little longer because I was going to have him come forward and t talk about his character. But uh, we'll let that go. And I'm going to be with him today. We're going to go over his character. You know what his character name is? Louis DeVille. Short for Lucifer Devil. <laughs> anyway, he's, a, a, he's sort of a slimy character. Anyway, and so I'm going to give three people some different things. And, and of course, Louie's going to say, all right, we're going to call some people down. Who's got a flashlight? And I make sure I give somebody a flashlight. And they'll say, oh, I got a flashlight. And they'll stand up. Come on down. Let's make a deal. And then we'll just make it short on each. We'll do three things, three characters, three temptations. We'll make it short. But it should have the message of we cannot trade our salvation or our relationship for any of the distractions of the world. Say amen. That I can measure how a, how a message is going to be by the resistance to it. Hello? I was always taught and have taught that just before a victory comes, the enemy somehow gets wind of it, and he starts the distractions and, and the situations, hoping to pull us away from believing for things that God has laid out, and get distracted and wander off the beaten track. Everyone say, not me. And so I measure sometimes how a service is going to go by the distractions and all the different things that go off. And so if you don't want to be a part of those distractions, you want to make sure you're prayed up, you're stayed up, and you're in tune with every piece of what you're going to do within God's service. Can you say amen? So we, there's milk of the word to receive the milk and understand the basic teachings. How many know there's basic teachings we're to know? And then as we proceed walking with the Lord, there's the meat. Can you say amen? We grow. So how does that work? Milk is receiving the word. Meat is doing the word. It's not any more or less revelation. Remember, God can only reveal to you as much as you're hungry to have revealed to you. Remember, blessed are those that hunger and thirst after what? Righteousness. They shall be filled. He didn't say, hey, I'm busy. I'll do it tomorrow. <laughs> Amen. Are you ready to get in the word?
All right. I want to let you know that uh, our opening scripture, I forgot to put it up, but I'm going to quote it for you. Most of you know it. It's John 10.10 10, if you're going to take notes. This one tells us there are two kingdoms operating in the earth. There's the kingdom of light. Everyone say amen. amen. And there's a kingdom of darkness. Now, don't make it any harder than that. I mean, people like to make things hard, so with the answer to the puzzle, they feel good. Listen, the, the gospel is so simple, and I always say it this way, even a caveman can learn it. Actually, cavemen were pretty smart. But even a child, even God makes it so available that a, a child that has a pure heart that wants to believe can understand the gospel. Gospel means good news. So two kingdoms, kingdom of light, kingdom of darkness. Now, when Adam fell, the kingdom of darkness came in the earth and took over. That's the devil's kingdom. It's called the mystery of iniquity. Uh, I'm going to say it right. The mystery of iniquity or the lawless sinfulness that's in the nature of sin. All right. So everyone say sin. Okay, two kingdoms now say sin and sins. Sin and sin. Okay, so what is that? Sin with the S-I-N singular means the nature of Satan. Sins means all the other things we described. Missing the mark, falling short, being able to get angry. These are, these are the result of the sin in our flesh. All right, how many are born again? So if you get born again, God removed the sin out of your spirit, put his spirit in there, you became a new creation. Say, I'm a new creation. But your flesh still has sin in it. So we bring it to God, ask him to reduce the resistant, resistance in it. Hello, have you ever had a bad day? And you realized you had a bad day? but you decided you were going to continue to have a bad day. <laughs> you see, the flesh wants to go off somewhere. You've got to present this animalistic thing, your flesh, before God so he can clean it, make it pliable, and make it humble and obedient. Your body is supposed to obey you. Can you say amen? Bring your body, you bring your body a living sacrifice. So our body is supposed to serve our spirit man, our new creature. Say amen. amen. All right. So two kingdoms. Sin means Satan's nature. So you cannot trust your flesh. And here's, here's the hard thing. You cannot trust the flesh of mankind. Someone say, oh, yeah. So that isn't saying everybody's dishonest, everybody's not good. That's just saying be careful because the flesh gives itself away. It's bragatory, it boasts, it talks too much, does things that it shouldn't. So you can tell when you're in the flesh, when things are out of order, and then you and God work on that and we get it together. But the world cannot tell. Hello. They speak of the world, they do the world things. Don't be so surprised. So John 10.10 10 says the thief, who's the thief in the Bible? Satan. The thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. I have come, Jesus is speaking, that you might have life and have it more abundantly. The word life there is a unique word. It's the Greek word zoe, which means life in nature and presence of God. You shall have life and have it more. Uh... So he's talking about not just having things, not having good things. He's talking about having a rich God relationship where you understand the mysteries of the kingdom. And we've been studying about the kingdom, haven't we? So we're going to go in and have another time. Okay, so let's get into our lesson. Again, this is the th third lesson we've done on the kingdom of God. And we're going to simply call it under the king's authority. Amen? Under the king's authority. So the scripture I gave to over the head, I forgot to give them, John 10.10. 10. So you can look it up. We quoted it early. So let me read my paragraph. Blessings to you, church family. Today we're going to share more on how God is building in us an unshakable kingdom. He's building not only in us, but he's building it already in the earth. The fact that Jesus came and he died and rose from the dead gives him all authority both in heaven and in earth, Matthew 28, 18. 
Jesus is called the last Adam because he completed the job the first Adam filled and restores what the first Adam lost. What did he lose? He lost the world and the earth, didn't he? Hello. Gave it over to the enemy. That's why darkness was on the face of the deep. That's why the earth was shifted and contorted and God had to restart everything. We'll get to that at a luncheon, maybe. All right, so let's go on and continue. I'm my bear paracas. So we know what happened. Adam lost the earth and gave it over to the enemy just for a time. But then Jesus came through his resurrection and gained all of it back and us as his family back. Now he gives us invitation because he doesn't make us be his children. He invites us to become a child of God. Can you say amen? He lost the entire family through generations, but now he's got it back. But he must have them come if they desire. That's why no one can know where to go, where to look for God, unless there is a preacher or a teacher that can guide. Hello? And that's why the enemy's been such at work trying to corrupt the teachers and preachers, give you some kind of pablum they call the word of God, so that we think we're getting fed when actually we're dying of malnutrition. Say, oh me. Now, the fact that after Jesus rose again, 50 days, 50 days after he rose again, or 40 days after he actually left the earth, he brought in a new kingdom, didn't he? And I, I need to talk just briefly. It's an invisible kingdom. At the day of Pentecost, it suddenly, suddenly there was a sound that came from heaven, like a mighty rushing wind. And it says it filled all the house where they were sitting at, Acts chapter 2. It filled all the house. Now, it not only filled all the house, but it filled all the earth. Remember, Jesus rose again from the devil, or excuse me, rose again from the dead and broke the, the devil's power, took the keys back. And now he could bring his spirit into the earth and with it, his kingdom. So there is an invisible kingdom. Now, what did we say about the word kingdom? It means dominion, power, jurisdiction, and what? Influence. So if you've got God's dominion and power working in you, and you do, depending on how much you relate and develop before God, then guess what? His influence will go before you. He'll start telling people that you're nice, you're cool. Start opening doors. That's part of his kingdom. Another thing is he has jurisdiction. So he's literally replacing the enemy and his control with his kingdom. And you know, he's got a special ambassador to do that. You and I, we bring the word. We bring the kingdom of God and we keep people awake. <laughs> Can you say amen? So our job is to share the word and the gospel of the kingdom. Can you say amen? All right, so let's go. We're going we're to cover four areas. Now, these are cool. Knowing what we have in Christ. Now, I know you know this, but I'm going to bring up some different things. Two, coming under God's authority, walking in power. We're going to cover three. All things, what all things are that pertain to life and godliness. You see a lot of all things. Now, just let me say it finally. All things in this case is not everything. Remember, all things can be all things pertaining to, say amen, pertaining to something. All things concerning Peggy. Is that all things concerning all of us? No, so you got to see what it's pertaining to. Hello? Someone say amen. And then fourth, we're going to cover walking in the spirit, enjoying the kingdom. Did you know for the longest time, it seems like Christians can't have a rest or peace I'm amazed. Christians been saved for years and years, and their life is still, now please, I'm not picking on anybody. Their life is still all agitated. Their, their thinking is everywhere. They're running on what they know, what they don't know. Hello, is that why the Lord kind of guides us? No, we're to learn how to walk in the spirit, live in the spirit. Why? Because here's the other part I want you to get. Living in the spirit 
means that you are out and away from the effects of the enemy. Can he get in the spirit? Let me ask you, come. Can, can, can Satan get in the spirit? No, he's spiritual, but he can't get in the spirit. He's been stripped. Can, can Satan get back into the throne of God? No. And when you pray, guess where you are? The throne of, you see, we need to go over some of the things that God has said about us, where we're at, what we think, what we shouldn't think, and begin to understand some things. Can you imagine? So, here's another thing. Aren't we covered in an armor that's called the armor of light? Don't we have put on the Lord Jesus Christ? So if we're within God and in the kingdom and we're in the armor of light and we're doing all that and in the spirit... See, we're out and away from Satan's grasp. But see, he didn't want us to know that, so he calls us religious. Let's be religious and walk in the spirit. And then you say, let's go to a worship service, and everybody looks like they died. Come on, laugh with me. He's Because he's painted an excuse that looks like godliness, having a form of godliness, but denying the power to to change us, you see, having a form but denying the power, having a form but denying the power. You got to talk, but your walks is a mess. So the idea is knowing the different kingdoms. So Satan cannot get in the spirit. That's why Paul said, and it kind of was skinnied out by the translators, walk in the spirit. He's actually in the Greek says, master, walking habitually, Within the realm of the spirit where Satan can't touch you. Now that's a bigger picture. Remember I told you when the truth gets a hold of you. And you start understanding it. You're kind of lifted up. Like in a balloon. Up a little higher. Where you can see more. Oh. Ah, you see. So when we pursue God he lifts us up. Hello. When we pursue God in his word he lifts us up. And of course, pursuit of God is also prayer, seeking him, being with him. All right, so we're going to cover those four areas. Let's go to them. All right, number one, growing, excuse me, knowing what we have in Christ. There's so much. But I want to let you know a couple of things maybe you didn't become aware of, or maybe are, but you just didn't apply it. The scripture should be up, but it's Ephesians chapter 1, please, verse 3 through 4. Now listen to the wordage. This is the Apostle Paul speaking. He says, blessed be the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed. I mean, when Jesus rose from the dead, he set a kingdom up and it has everything in it. Everyone say everything in it. Healing, soundness, wholeness, power and gifts and calling has everything in it. Our job is to find our spot and let God lead us and train us in how to use them. Can you say amen? Has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness, spiritual blessings in heavenly places. Now look at the location. Remember, they are important to look at locations in scripture. It says where? On earth? Earthly places? Heaven. Heaven. Upper. Higher places. Hello, we need to look up. We need to keep our mind up, our eyes up. Why? So he can get our attention and show us what we have. Say amen. Now, it goes on further to say, in, in heavenly places in Christ, just as he chose us. Now, I had a lady bring it up. He says, did God really know us before we were born? I said, absolutely. He says, well, did God really purpose in his heart what we're going to be, what we're not going to be? Yeah. He says, isn't that predestination? I said, yeah, the way it's supposed to be. But listen, the false teaching of predestination is the teaching that God has your life laid out. You just can go out and do whatever you want. You're going to do what he wants anyway. Now, does that sound like God? You know where that came from. No, he always wanted us to be with him. He always wants us to be whole. He always wants us to have a father. Let him father us. Can you say amen? It's never changed. It's all about getting away so we can have a family again, but we have to go through Jesus. So we are blessed with every spiritual blessing, but are in a higher realm. We have to be in the spirit realm. Do you see it now? Do you see it? Higher places, spirit realm. 
See, he chose us before the foundation of the world that we should be holy, set apart, and without blame before him in love. The only way we can do that is following Jesus. I'm going to walk. I'm going to walk with Jesus. Can you say amen? I'm going to say what he says to say. Amen. I'm going to do what he says to do. Amen. I come to do not my own will, but the will of the Father. Amen. Let's go on to John chapter 14. Look at verse 26. How many know we have the Holy Spirit came? When the kingdom came, the Holy Spirit came and all his gifts. So here we have in verse 26 of John 14. But the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will what? Teach you. Everyone underline that if you've got your Bible. He will teach you what things? All right. Do you think he's going to teach you all the nasty things? So it must be it all things pertain to something. I want you to get the difference. Remember, there's two kingdoms. They're not mixed. You understand? Your father is not a turncoat, double-minded fool. Excuse me. I don't mean that father, but... But listen, he knows exactly everything he does is good and perfect. So do you notice how Jesus says, all things? Okay, I want you to get that. Send to my father and he will, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance. See, this is spiritual things. Not in your head, but in your spirit. You've got all kinds of goodies in your spirit. So don't try to memorize just enjoy God. Delight yourself in the Lord, the Bible says, and he will give us the desire. He'll bring it right out of you. Because let me ask you, who lives in your spirit? Jesus does. God lives in your spirit. Does he know everything? Great. So therefore, you don't have to necessarily memorize it. Just be familiar with it, and you'll bring it up out of your spirit. Say, hey, man. Let's drop down. We got that part. His job is to teach us. And all things pertains, okay? Romans 8, 32 kind of narrows it down a little bit more. Look at this. Beautiful. He who did not spare his own son, that's the Father God, but delivered him up for what? For us. For us all. How shall he not with Jesus? See, you have to have Jesus in your heart. Also freely give us what? Give us what? Did you say all things? Okay, now, see, if we don't have a clarity what all things are, we could be believing for sickness. Well, God, you must allow this for something. Now, don't talk like that. That shows only you don't read the scripture and know. You're listening to everybody else's input. You've got to go after the heart of God. And the only way we can do that, and this is really important, is by spending time. You see, I knew my father. I loved my father. I respected my father. <laughs> it's a, can you imagine? He was a wonderful man. But I never got to know my father until I spent time with him. There's a lot of people, now listen, don't get mad at me, do a lot of talk about God, and some of them are excellent. But you can tell when they get off by themselves what comes out of them by how much the relationship they have because somebody who spends a lot of time with God doesn't talk as if, what if, I wonder what's going on. They know their father. They know every day supplies good. They live in a kingdom with a different economy. You know, we're not judged and ruled by the world's economy. Can you say amen? Even though it seems like we are. No, we're in God's economy in the kingdom. That's why your eyes have to be up knowing that he will take care of these. Don't you know your father knows what you have need for before you ask? But you have to ask to receive. So therefore, once you ask to receive, you don't continue to wonder if he's going to do it. Moving right along. All right, do you see? A couple of parts I want to give you on this first. Church, with all our hearts, we are to go after the understanding that God, what he wants for us. To know the word and all his provisions he has given us in Christ. This is why if you have two covenants, you want to study the newest one and not to understand the oldest one. Why it failed. But everybody, the enemy's got everybody searching all over and they don't establish the truth. Number one, if you read too much Old Testament, you'll lose who God is. 
Why is that, Pastor Kerry? Because you'll think God uses circumstances to teach. He did in the Old Testament because nobody was born again. Now, in the New Testament, we are born again. So let me talk to you. That means you got God in the side. He's the leader right here. You got a leader system in you, a GPS, God system. And it's all geared up. Okay, ready to go. But make sure your flesh is not, and your own reasoning is not shutting it down. So that's the purpose of going to God, to have the flesh knock back and everything, so that the GPS, God's power and spirit, can put you over. Can you say amen? So we step back and let him step forward, and we follow God. Amen. The Lord is my shepherd, and I... Amen. Two. The enemy has been hiding these special truths that I'm sharing with you. That's why we get gigged a lot. Man, I, I've never seen a church get zapped sometimes as small as this one. It's the quality of the word and the specialty of your hearts, how you're growing. Satan hates all that. Might as well play religion. He'll leave you alone. He'll be packed. Hello? Now, I'm not putting anything down. I'm just showing you that he loves the flesh. He loves people in the flesh, living for God, doing all that they can do without letting the spirit do the leading. All right. So anyway, the enemy has been hiding truths for us. And we just remember 120 years ago, what did the church look like? And is in the, in the way often time to keep us from little nuggets. Hello? So he's been high in truth from us. And in this same way, we must look and seek after the kingdom. Why? Because if we don't look and seek after the kingdom, we might not find it. Have you ever been lost looking for an address? What did you have to do to get it? You had to look for it. Well, you see, God monitors the heart. If you're so selfish content... Then, then your GPS system is there, but it's not running. You've got your flesh covering it. So you're liable to get lost, wander a bit, until you get with God, and all that's cleansed off your lens, and the GPS gets all charged up. How many of you know your phone is good, but without a charge, guess what? It's dead. And so you don't die, but you need charges every day. You need a good dose of the Holy Ghost to keep everything in the GPS and all the warnings and all the systems that God has equipment that he gave you. Did you know why we have an elm, helmet of salvation? Because it helps us during the time of battle and living to keep our mind right. The helmet is not only to protect us from bad thoughts, but to help our mind work right. See? Because we're, it's the Lord Jesus' mind helmet. It's equipment, but you can't see it. All right, let's go on. Third point is we are to get with with the whole program. And that's where the enemies has us so distracted. And we allow the Holy Spirit to teach us. Are you hungry to learn? And reveal things. Download them right down through the Spirit. Now I said this last week. I want you to get it this week. The Holy Spirit comes and reveals things. Revelation. Reveals things to us. Not in our intellect. I was, taught, I was taught you get it in your head and then it drops down in your heart. No, no, no. Who do you have in your heart? Jesus. So you got it in your heart. So when, God, when we read the Bible or we hear a sermon or we get a word and it comes alive, that's a revelation. It's immediately downloaded into your spirit man. In other words, your spirit man's good ground. Your head is not so good. And your, our flesh is being whole. But anyway, he downlo downloads it right in our spirit. Even though we might not understand all of it, it bursts and blasts and comes alive. Now, that's why the Bible says that the eyes of our understanding become enlightened. We get it in our spirit. It explodes. Oh, whoa, look at that. That's cool. It comes up into the eyes of our understanding. And then we can begin to start practicing. A uh, doer of the word, can you say amen? Second point, coming under God's authority, very important. Do you think the devil comes under God's authority? No. And you know what? If you say, I come to you in Jesus' name, the devil has to go. He cannot resist. I've had people say, you know, I rebuked the devil and he just hung around. Now think about that. If you rebuke the devil in the name of Jesus and you think he's still hanging around, what's the problem? 
you think he's still around. Because the devil's been stripped and he has to obey the authority of God. Say amen. amen. That means everything that he's done or created or caused is also subject to the name of Jesus. Can you say amen? That's why cancer is subject to the name of Jesus. That's why arthritis is subject to the name of Jesus. Deafness is subject to the name of Jesus. You who are a believer, maybe you have something that's weak, kind of like I do in my system. I'm believing every day, and often I will take the word of God, which is medicine to my flesh, and speak it at the problem. You will come in line in Jesus' name. Body, you will settle down. Can I talk to my body like that? Yeah, because your body's not the real you. Is your coat the real you? Are your pants the real you? No, it's just clothing. You're clothed with a tent in the body. We learned that last week. That is not from God. It's corrupted. We can't wait to change. Can you say amen? All right, second point now. Amen. Knowing, knowing... Coming under God's authority. John chapter 1, please. Verse 10 through 18. Are you getting anything out of this? I mean, I'm all fired up, but I want to get this in sequence to you. How many know the pastor teaches in series and sequences? In other words, last week, if you kind of missed it, you're missing a chunk. Go back and review it if you can. Take the notes. And they're in series. And that's why sometimes, you know, I kind of, I want you to not miss a block. When you're building a house, you don't want to be missing some lumber. <laughs> and there are a lot of Christians that seem like they're missing a brick or two. And please laugh with me. Hello? Uh, I, I, Scott and I discussed this years ago. How that some Christians, God can use them mightily but only uses them in the area they're close to God with. And the rest of their life could be, there's missing a few chunks. And I said, yeah, I've seen it for years. That's why I stepped out of the ministry for a while. My life was pretty shot. And he says, because we don't get into the presence of God and allow him to develop it in our spirituality and our stability and our character, amen, and our endurance. Remember the four ways that a, a, a tree grows. All right, you got it? All right, so John 1 verse 10 says, He was in the world, this is Jesus, and the world was made through him. Father thought it, Jesus spoke it, and the Holy Spirit brought it to pass. And the world did not what? Know him. If you want an update on that, Romans chapter 1. He came to his own, that's the Jewish people, that's the Israelites. And look at what happened. And his own did not what? Aren't you glad? Because then he came to everybody. He says, they won't receive me to the Jew first, then to the Gentile, everybody else. Because they rejected, we've got salvation. Of course, that was God's plan overall. Hello? So now you want to know that the Jews, just because they're Jewish, don't have any special favor with God. In fact, they've gotten his anger up quite a few times. But thank God for the obedient, loving God, Jewish Israelites. Amen. And you want to pray for them, and you want to bless them that all of Israel be saved. All right, so moving past that, let's go on to what he further said. Okay. And he says, who were born, it says, but as many as received him, say, that's me. To them he gave the right or authority to become the children of God. Say amen. Say so you're not a sinner, I'm a, I'm a son. That means there's a different set of rules on you. you know, sin is still sin and wrong is still wrong. But God doesn't deal with you as an enemy. He deals with you as a son. I quoted there for you. Amen. That means when you make a mistake, he's willing to pick you up and help you out. Just don't be all full of yourself. Waddle around in the mud puddle. Moving past. Moving past. So look what it says. And the, this is the next part. Who were born, see, we believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of God, or will of flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. 
Now look at verse 14. And the word became what? Flesh. That's the whole mystery of the power of godliness. And dwelt among us. Why? So everybody could see what God was really like by handling and being with Jesus, watching the miracles. He was seeing God the Father, God the Son, and the Spirit of God moving right there. And we beheld his glory. The glory there also should be image. And the image, the glory, as of the only begotten of the Father. Full of what? Grace and truth. You see, the law came through Moses by the hand of a mediator, Moses. But grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. Aren't you glad we have grace and truth? Because we're sons and daughters of God. We're not just servants. Goes on further to say in verse 16. And of his fullness, we have all, those that are born again, received. And the grace for grace, for the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has seen God at any time. There he is standing there. The only begotten son who is the, in the bosom of the father, he has declared him. Philip, he that has seen me has seen the father. The idea is mankind was stolen God. They knew not God in the Old Testament. They knew about God. They were afraid of God. The enemy was like masquerading as God. And boy, it was a confusing mess. Jesus had to come to where fallen man was and redeem them. Amen. A couple of points I'm going to give you. Number one, God has set up a complete kingdom. Say amen. There's no flaws in it. To replace the kingdom of darkness. Two, the kingdom of heaven is full of light, power, provided that we come under the king. Do you remember the story of the sons of Shiva? They saw Paul cast out devils. They heard about Jesus casting out devils. And they had a person in their midst that had a devil. So they immediately started to try to cast this devil out. Well, the devil said this. This is the point I'm trying to make. He says, I know Jesus and I know Paul, but who are you guys? What they were doing is trying to use the kingdom without the key and knowing the king. Hello. I'm going to say this to you. Many Christians today have been serving God with their heart. They love God, but they don't know God because they're trying to know God by understanding him instead of just being like a child, being with him. Do you understand the richness in that? I will never know my father until I spend time with him. I can hear about him. I can talk about him. I can even read about him. But to know him takes time with him. Next point is, our responsibility, brother and sister, is to study about the kingdom of God so we understand it, how it operates, how to walk within the kingdom in the spirit. And the Holy Spirit is supposed to train us how to be spiritual. How many know you can't be spiritual in the flesh? That's Galatians. No, you can't try hard to be spiritual. You can't fast long enough to be spiritual. We found out how to get in the spirit. How do we get in the spirit? Father, in Jesus' name, boop, boop, you're in the spirit. Now, you better not play with that. That's why it says, that don't take the name of God without any meaning. Vain. Got something sticky on my lips there. Anyway, so you go, Father, in Jesus' name, and you focus on Christ. You just imagine Christ. When you do, the spirit moves you right into the spirit. That means suddenly you disappear before the devil. His kingdom goes, whoop, they went blank. Have you watched some of those sci-fi movies? I'm a sci-fi guy. You know, all of a sudden they walk into a dead zone. Boop, we lost them. Duh. Don't you think God's far more advanced than the religious garbage we've been taught? Religious garbage. I mean, I was taught that Satan listens in on our prayers. I said, where'd you get that? And the guy goes, well, I don't know. I was told that too. You see, I was told and I was taught that there's holes in the armor. 
You only have armor in the front because you don't have any armor in the back like a Roman soldier. <laughs> so never run from the enemy because he'll get you in the back. I mean, we were taught this in Bible college. Here's what I love this one. How many know our good shepherd is a good shepherd? All right. And, and here's a little bit of wisdom before I go on. Do not use human experience above the word. I don't care. If you were never healed, but you believed in healing, you cannot say, God never healed me because the word of God says you were healed over 2,000 years ago. So never say something that's against what God says. You're supposed to say things that God says. That's called confession. If you sin, say, I sinned. Forgive me. If you say, I need help, say, I need help. If you love the word, say the word. But don't confess all the stuff that is complete religious garbage. Can you say amen? Oh, the Lord giveth and the Lord took away. My family, my property, all oh, bless the name of the Lord. You know, I went to a church like that once and I left. <laughs> I recommend you leave too. Don't blame God for things he cannot do. And don't explain God away by circumstances that you experienced. Put everything and locate everything through the life and the word of God. Say amen. Uh, where was I? All right, so it's our responsibility to bring ourselves to God and, and to get transformed. And then finally, you're not a sinner anymore. Say amen. You're a child of God. You have an inheritance. So Satan wants to keep making us feel like a sinner, a failure. Oh, we never amount to it. And he also make people like me who teach always annoying. I'll be annoying to you. Why? Because I don't sit around and talk bull. I talk God. So if you take me fishing, guess what you're going to hear? Yeah. About fish? Not so much, because I don't know a whole lot. But you're going to hear about God. So don't expect me to be half backslidden so I can talk to you. You see how funny we think. There's a life with God, and then there's a life off by ourselves. It better be the same life, or you're going to have to answer for quite a bit. Moving right along, third point. All things that pertain to life and godliness. Folks, when you read all things, please recognize the all things, what they're about, or to whom. Say amen. Go with me, please, to Romans 8, 32. We read it earlier, but this is a good one. In fact, if you don't get anything else in this sermon, get this. We need to know what's of God and what's not of God. Can you say amen? In the Old Testament, the scripture is, I has not seen nor ear heard nor have considered in the heart of man the things that God has prepared for them. But if you continue reading on, it says, but God has revealed it to us by his spirit, launches it down in our spirit and shows us a better way. His name is Jesus. So Romans 8, 32 again. He who did not spare his own son, that's to redeem us, but delivered him up for us all. How shall he not with Jesus say, we're joined together, so we're a new creation. God's spirit and our spirit are one. So we are with Jesus. Also freely give us how many things? Who can quote 2 Corinthians 5, 17? Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things have passed away. And behold, behold, all things have become new. Now, not everything. Something did. So I'm trying to give you a biblical pointing to what Paul said in Romans 8, 28, where it says, all things work together for good to them that love God, to them that are called according to his purpose. Now, we love God and we're called according to his purpose. Think about it. If everything he's talking about, plane crashes, sicknesses, some of the stuff that we go through, if God is using that in such a good way, why is he standing in the way of God inside of you? He's contrary to himself. You see, you need to look at every scripture complete, corally, logically. God is good and perfect. Can you say amen? He's not confused. Nor is he contrary. A double-minded God is unstable in all his ways. <laughs> Laugh with me. I've been preaching that for years. Now listen. So he, with Christ, has given us all things. Second Peter 1, please. This is a wonderful... Oh, get into this. Don't, don't go sleeping on me now. Second Peter 1, verse 2 through 4. Grace and peace be multiplied. In other words, 
peace and grace can be multiplied to you through the knowing about or knowing of God and of Jesus our Lord. Of the knowledge of God and Jesus our Lord. As his divine power has given to us what? What? Now, is he talking about everything? Now, he's talking about something. And he says, what all things? Now, he tells us what those all things are. He has given to us all things that pertain to what? Oh, thank you. Through the knowledge of him. So, the more I can teach you about Jesus, the more you can pick up on Jesus. Guess what? The more you're knowledgeable about the all things that you have. Now, let me tell you. God brought the kingdom in the earth. It's invisible. But unless you develop in Jesus, develop and allow the kingdom of God develop in you, you'll never see what God has given you. You might have heard about a car, but you never, never rode in one. Until one day you see it, you get in. So the enemy's been hiding truths from us. Oh, for so long. And God's been revealing to his children that will come after him. Folks, not everybody's getting stuff like this. And it's not that amazing. But they're not getting the meat. You see, when I eat the word of God, it's nutrients. When I eat the words like a stomach, chew, chew, chew. And all of a sudden, it's adding strength and nutrients. Even if my understanding is not getting everything. Moving right along. So grace and peace are multiplied through the knowledge of him. He has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue, by which he has given to us exceeding great and precious promises, that through these promises you may be partakers of the divine nature, having, now listen, this is a hard one, having escaped the world through lust. Now, folks, there's two of you. Remember we talked about the old man and the, you're escaping the old man because it has lust. Listen, the things I used to like to do, I don't like to do. Paul said it this way. When I was a child, I spoke as a child. I did childish things. Carrie, when I was younger, I rode a tricycle. Graduated to a bike, a stingray. Hello, you see? God wants to build in us from the inside out his treasures of the kingdom, but he's not going to do it if he won't come after them. You know that little story says, don't take what is holy and reveal it to the swine. Hello? I asked him about that. He's referring to our flesh. Don't try to tell some, somebody who's always thinking of themselves something important because they won't hear a word you say. You could be saying something to somebody who wants to hear it. Don't cast the pearls before the swine. Now, he's not calling people swine. He's calling our flesh swine. That's why he called his disciples. He says, you being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children. How much more will your heavenly father give you the Holy Spirit to those that ask him? Are you still walking with me? Can you say amen? All right, point one, church when we read in scripture, the phrase, all things, must be clarified. Why? We need to understand what all things are pertaining to. Two, never forget the dividing line of scripture. Everyone say dividing line of scripture. Line of scripture. Get this. This is what the first thing my pastor taught me. Remember who's who. What kingdom is in operation? Remember God gave you the dip. The gift to discern, not to judge, but to discern right from wrong. So listen to this. This is good. The dividing line of Scripture is in James 1.17. Every good and perfect gift comes down from the Father of lights where he doesn't change nor alter his ways. He deals with his kids. He's always the same. Can you say amen? So how, what kind of gift? Good and perfect. So if you're wandering through the wilderness and saying, hey, God's doing this to me. First of all, you just blame God for something you did. You're wandering there because you didn't listen. Usually every wilderness, no, listen, careful. I'm not picking on any of us. Every wilderness that I wandered in was because I didn't listen to God's warning. 
So God is not dealing negativity to you to teach you. You are bringing negativity on yourself. Remember, you have a believer. And it attracts. So if you believe tomorrow you're going to be sick, guess what's going to happen usually? You will actually attract it. If you think you're always, whenever you work hard, you're going to have problems with your bones, then you'll attract that problem and it'll launch onto you. Now, not everything's the spirit. Not everything's like that. But see, it's not the one time saying it. Here's what Christians don't, don't understand. It's not the one time. To, let's, say, let's say I used to make fun of a lot of people I used to do when I was younger. I mocked and, and put things down. You see, God is not so much interested in us doing that one thing, putting something down. He's very, very, very concerned that we become that way, period. In other words, that becomes a habit with us to put people down, to comment on things. Some people do that and they don't even know they're doing it. And you see, that's what the devil wants. He wants us hung up on something that really is not edifying to ourselves or anyone else. And just sort of pass it on as uh, something like a pass. Someone say, oh, me. God needs to cleanse that out. So the right, writing, divi- other scripture that divides, the, I, I said it all wrong. The other dividing line of scripture is where it says in John, God is light and in him is what? So you have to look at all scripture through the life of Christ. Old Testament, when you're in the Old Testament, if it looks like God is doing some very harsh things, you need to know why and for whom he's doing it to and what has caused it. But you still know God is good and perfect, don't you? Now, people come to me and say, well, pastor, you said that the Old Testament is fulfilled and kind of done away with. And I says, yeah, because it has flaws. But listen, this this is what you need to tell people. God made it perfect and good. But the flaw is us trying to live up to the law. How many know no one can keep the law? The idea of the law, perfect in design, was to tell us we need Jesus. That's all. To the Jew, it's an entire program. But to the Gentile, it just says, hey, Carrie, get over yourself. You got all these problems you solved. Just come to me and I will save you. That's what a New Testament believer. Remember, we're in the New Testament and it says, whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be. Don't forget these things. We try to cross the Testaments and then we get a blurred skew. No, bright and clear. Say amen. So if you still have a skewed understanding, Don't accept that. Don't talk about it. Ask God for clarity. See, amen. Everything good and perfect. Everything light, not darkness. So that's your dividing line. So now we know something happened to the world. We know that Lucifer fell. We know sin is running rampant. We know people have to choose what God they're going to serve. But you and I know better. We know our God is perfect, just. He sent Jesus and we must follow him. Who's our ticket out of here? Who's our ticket off the planet? No one leaves without Jesus in their heart. Isn't that sad? Well, what about the Old Testament? No, they believed in a future Christ. And Jesus put it on their account for righteousness. All right, let's go on. All right, the last point, thank God. Walking in the Spirit, enjoying the kingdom. Did you know you're supposed to enjoy God? You're supposed to delight yourself in him. Look at all he's done for us. But see, what the enemy's doing is getting so caught up in our problems. You look at a beautiful couple, they start coming to church, then you don't see them. What's the problem? Uh They're caught up in their problems instead of continuing on. God sometimes has to pull you through the bushes by following him. He didn't make the bushes. But you're way out in the bushes, so he's got to pull you through to get you free. He doesn't leave you, but you got to follow him out. You can't still do the crazy things you did two, three years ago as a Christian and expect to get the better results now. 
And I can think of some, so many wonderful Christians that are so entangled with life here on earth. God doesn't want us that way. Don't engage yourself in the affairs of this life, but rather engage yourself in God. Moving right on. <laughs> All right, you ready? Galatians 5, 16, please, through 18. Here's Paul writing. He says, you want to cure the problem? Paul says, I know it. Read Romans 7. You'll see I had a big struggle. But now I say to you, walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the desires or lusting of the flesh. Remember, your flesh is not good. For the flesh, yeah, lusts against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. See, they can't get to crossing the negative with the positive. And these are contrary to one another so that you, listen, listen to the phrase, so that you do not do the things that you wish. So if you're finding yourself a hard time doing things, you're, you're double-minded, flesh, spirit, flesh, spirit, you're going like this, your eyes are down, not up, you're not praying, you're not here, and so the enemy's got you in what I call turmoil. We need to get out of that as fast as possible, Amen. He wants you to make you ineffective. But if you be led of the Spirit, in other words, let the Holy Spirit guide you out because he always guides us out, never in. Did you notice that he was trying to get the Israel out of the wilderness into the promised land? Whoa. He never guides us into a problem. People are teaching that God puts us in a hard time because the hard time is going to make us shine for Jesus. Are you kidding if you live? No, you got it all backwards. I was sitting under a lady one time, just once, then I left. She says, life is like a great big wheel. That all of us are on this wheel, and the wheel's rolling down the road. So it comes your turn, you come under the crushing of the wheel. And it crushes you somehow like a flower and makes you smell good. I looked at her, I said, where did you get that? She was taking human experience to try to explain the word. You never do that as a teacher. Maybe you are going through things you don't understand. Please don't tell others all the time about it. It's like telling the devil, hey, you're winning, boo-boo. <laughs> never talk what the devil's told you and never believe what he says. Oh, hallelujah. Don't preach myself happy. Why? Why, Pastor Kerry? But if you be led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now, the law he's talking about is more than just the Ten Commandments. And most Christians don't know. How many know that when Adam and Eve sinned, there came a curse into the earth? This is the law of sin and death. You find it in Romans 8, verse 2. Spirit of God made us free from the law of sin and death. Now, the law, the Ten Commandments, pointed out the law of sin and death. I would have never known sin except for the law, Paul said. He points. I would never know where Puyallup is if I didn't see the sign. <laughs> Hello? Yeah. All the stuff in the Old Testament is a sign for who is already here. Jesus. Everyone say, Jesus. Very seldom talks about when he's going to come again. So everybody's guessing and giving prophecy and all that. Be very careful what you say is of God. Say amen. amen. All right. But then it goes on. But the fruit of the Spirit, everyone say fruit. fruit. Notice it didn't say fruits. Fruit. One fruit, Jesus, has many different kinds of manifestations. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. Listen, if your life's out of control, guess who's not in charge? Just, just say, Lord, I'm sorry. Help me get in charge. Stop rolling around making excuses. Say, oh, me. And he says, against, against such, this kind of life, this kind of fruitfulness of Christ, there is no law of sin and death. Can you say amen? There is no law of sin and death. For those that are Christ have crucified what? The flesh, your job is to bring it to God and say, kill it, Lord. I'm serious. Lord, kill my flesh. Because it's the one that the enemy allows it to get. It has pains and, and 
owies and stuff. Kill it off. If you start killing it off right away, and the spirit starts running your life, which it's supposed to, you won't make as many as bone-chilling, muscle-rending, overworking, tired things. You're, you just won't do that as much. Because the moment you go to do too much, the spirit of God in you will say, ah, you can do that tomorrow. Come on, everyone, take a breath. God wants you to enjoy, not to try to every, get everything done at the last minute. God's not in a hurry. He knows exactly how to get you where you are if you stop pulling around, flopping around. Most Christians flop around so much, it takes them long enough to try to get them to where they can hear God again. What are you doing at home and caught up in your problems? If you're, if you're a beautiful problem solver, but unplugged from your source of power, then you're deceived. You see, if I'm a beautiful person, but I never spend any time with God, how do you think I'm going to fix God and fix the problems? I'm unplugged. Nobody likes that, but that's just the truth. Satan's playing a lot of Christians for dummies. Say, I'm not one. I'm not going to play his game. So get out of your head, more into your heart like a child. Let's go to Romans 8. Look at 12 through 14. Look at this. Therefore, brethren, we are not debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if anyone live according to the flesh, you will be separated from God. You'll die. But if by the Spirit you put to death, by bringing your body in before God, the deeds of your body, you will live. For as many as are what? Led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. So what does that say about those who are not led by the Spirit of God, Pastor Kerry? There's only two of you. The spiritual you and the fleshly you. Can you say amen? So if you see Christians are bumbling and stumbling around, are they walking in the Spirit? Boy, you guys are real, she real sheepy on that. Yeah, they're not walking in the Spirit. And God doesn't want us to try to live for Him physically only. He wants us to try to live and honor Him, but we really live for Him spiritually. Can you say amen? From Jesus, through Jesus. So what the enemy does is he keeps moving us out of the spiritual realm into a works program of do, do, and, and get it done, done, until we begin to wear ourselves down. Ha ha, let's not do that, say amen. Likewise, the Spirit helps our weaknesses. Do you believe that? Yes. Now, Holy Spirit dwells in you. Now, the word help there is a unique word. 14, 13, 14 letters. It means takes hold with you against everything that charges against you. Takes hold with you against sickness. Take hold with you against feeling weak or feeling insecure. Just pray in the spirit, get in the spirit, because he takes hold with you to become your partner, to put you over in life. Say amen. But we got to follow him. We've got to do what he instructs us to do in order to get the results that he promised. Then he goes, as many as are led by the Spirit. Likewise, the Spirit helps our weaknesses when you fall short. For we do not know how to pray for as we ought. Sometimes it's just overwhelming. But the Spirit himself makes intercession. Where does the Spirit live? In our hearts. For us with groanings. Oh, God, I don't know. Help. We cannot be uttered. Now he, God, who searches the hearts, people, knows what's in the mind of the Holy Spirit. Because he makes intercession for the saints, according to the will of God. Verse 28, after all that, everybody, we know that all things. Now, is he talking about everything? Of course not. But we've been told that for years. Now, let me just say this to you. Don't get in odds. God can work a miracle out of any problem, any disaster. But to teach people that God uses disasters and he's going to bring something good out of it, it's, it's comforting. But here's what God's actually saying. The all things that pertain to life and godliness that God has put in you with Jesus in your spirit are at work every day for your good. Hello. While even though our outward man perish, our inward man is being renewed, working for our good every day. 
So when you hear all things that be of God in you are working for good, according to those that are called of God, who live according to his purpose. Now you understand. To tell a young Christian that God took my mother and, and our family and we lost our property, but now I serve Jesus, is so insulting. Shows you haven't got a clue who God is. Son, I'd kick your little buns over the gold pulse of life into the prayer. Because most Christians are suffering the time that they need to spend with God. Because I know my father. See, people who teach we're going through the tribulation don't know their heavenly father. All they know about him. All they'll tell you scripture and everything. But just think about it. You show me anywhere in the scripture where the father put somebody, one person he loved, into a problem just so he could suffer with the wicked. It's not in there anywhere. Now listen, people suffer. People go through problems. I'm saying they don't. I'm not saying they don't. But I'm saying to suffer a judgment with the wicked is the most stupid thing I've ever heard. Look at Lot. Look at Noah. Look at all of the deliverance. Even Paul says, out of them all God delivered me. The idea is to think that God is so stupid to use everything to try to make you love him more. That's like me taking my son and burning his hand and say, now you'll learn not to play with matches. It really pulls from the character of God. God is perfect, right? And good. Say, God is perfect. So if you hear something about God that's not perfect, describes kind of a flawed character, you need to ask a lot of questions. Say amen. amen. So the Spirit is here on our benefit. Now we know all things work together for good to those that love and are called according to His purpose. Now look, at for whom he foreknew, that's you and I, he predestinated, he planned for us to be perfect, to be conformed to the image of his son, just like Jesus, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren, Jesus firstborn from the dead, to leave this planet. Moreover, whoso he predestinated, these he also called. Whom he also called, that's you and I, these also he justified. And whom he justified, he also glorified. Church is very clear that God is talking about all of us. He will not put you and punish you the way the world does. Now, there are many Christians that killed in wars and all those kind of things. God has an answer for all of that depending your nation and all. But to say, God's going to put us through the tribulation when the tribulation is only for punishment of the earth for the treatment of Jews, God, and Christians. Now, if he's, we're here Christians going through the trip, believe me, we're suffering now. But see, God said to look up, didn't he? He said, you get in the spirit. Look up, get in the spirit. Stop playing around with the world. Stop judging the world. Oh, look, this is coming out. Going to be a war here. And I see you're all entangled again. God says, bring a message of clarity. Bring a message of freedom. Bring a message that I said, the works that I do shall you do also. And even greater works than you shall do. Why? Because I'm in you. I'm with you. And you have the power inside of you. Get your eyes up. If you got something out of that today, give the Lord a praise. Hallelujah. Man, God is good.